Well, in October of 1971, Jesus Christ super, Superstar opened at the Hellinger Theater in New York City with a London production opening in August of 1972. Jesus Christ Superstar, by the time it closed over eight years later, became the longest running musical in West End history. Its writers, Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber, actually referred to it as a rock opera, not a musical. The album rose to number one on the Billboard charts in 1971, and in 1973 was made into a movie. Now you'd think that Christians would have been thrilled with all this attention that Jesus Christ Superstar was generating, but they were not thrilled. In fact, they were outraged. And that was because in this rock opera, Jesus was presented as a mere man, not the incarnate God. It ended with Jesus hanging on a cross with no resurrection to follow. Now, over the years, other songs and plays and films had people thinking about Jesus. For instance, former Beatle George Harrison released the song, My Sweet Lord, which some first thought it was about Jesus, but upon closer listening, discovered it was about Hare Krishna. Monty Python made the movie The Life of Brian, which was a satire or a mockumentary about how anyone could have been mistaken for the Messiah, as Jesus was. And then uh, a while back, The Da Vinci Code was uh, produced and put out, a film in which Jesus' name and image was uh, drugged through the mud quite a bit. The author, Dan, uh, Dan Brown, claims that basically everything that we have come to believe about Jesus was false. He says that Jesus was a good man, a moral man, but nothing more. Certainly not God's son, not the Savior, not divine. Well, not surprisingly, Christians in our country were pretty upset about this. Because similar to how Oliver Stone did in his film, JFK, where he mixed actual historical footage in with his own personal conspiracy theories where you couldn't really tell one from another, Dan Brown did the same thing in The Da Vinci Code. Now, what if The Da Vinci Code and The Life of Brian and Jesus Christ Superstar, what they say about Jesus, what if that is true? If that's true, then your hope for forgiveness and eternal life have just evaporated. If Jesus is not divine, but simply a good man, then we're all kind of wasting a lot of time here. So today we're going to look at the facts about who Jesus Christ really was and is. Well, again, I'm glad you're here today. As you probably know, we're in a little series this summer uh, on the four chapter 95 verse uh, New Testament book of Colossians. This book, originally written as a letter, was written by uh, the Apostle Paul to a church in the city of Colossae. Paul was a follower of Christ, and when he was around 30 years old is when he became a follower of Christ. This letter was written almost 60 years later, so he's around 90 years old. So this is a man, Paul, at his the fullness of wisdom, battle-proven, a seasoned man of God when he wrote this particular book. But you know, even back in Paul's day, if you read the New Testament, there are those, there were some who had their own beliefs and opinions about who Jesus really was. And I want to take a moment here and just to reflect on this question of what and who was Jesus really? They say at this point in human history, around maybe 100 billion people is the best estimate of how many people have walked the face of this earth. 100 billion people have been born, have lived, and died or are still alive right now. There have been great kings, uh, intelligent scientists who have brought, you know, discoveries that have changed the world. There have been athletes, business leaders, military leaders, inventors, and yet one man stands tall above all 100 other billion people as having the largest impact upon humankind. I mean, the, Jesus was extra extraordinary in the impact he has had on the world. He is extraordinary in his teachings. You know, there has never been a person's teachings who have been written about and spoken about as much as the words of Jesus. They have been discussed, debated, and defended more than anyone who has ever lived. Any of you watched the Michael Jordan Last Dance documentary on ESPN recently? Probably a lot of us did. Well, it kind of brought back the question of who is the greatest basketball player of all time? The debate, the debate usually comes down to five players, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Michael Jordan, and LeBron James. Now, I grew up watching Bill Russell 
and Wilt Chamberlain, and I've watched a lot of games with Kareem. I've seen a lot of LeBron James games. Michael Jordan played 1,251 career NBA games, and I watched, I'm ashamed to admit, at least 1,000 of them over all those years. For me, I think Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. But you know something? 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, what difference will that make? What difference will that make? Which makes Jesus so unique because for over 2,000 years, Jesus has been debated. Many have tried to actually discredit his place in history, his place as the Son of God, and many have defended him. No one has faced more scrutiny than he has. And yet after all his critics and after all his doubters have died and faded into oblivion, Jesus still stands. No informa new information has unearthed uh, things that can discredit him. He has stood the test of time. And multitude, multiplied millions and millions of people still love him today and serve him and follow him. Jesus is also unparalleled in his moral impact. His life and his teachings are unsurpassed and their ability to inspire people to live their lives according to higher moral standards. From presidents to prisoners, Jesus' power to bring out the good in people is unmatched. Jesus is also without peer in his impact on the world of art. He has inspired more of the world's great art and music than any other person. He has, has inspired more movies and movie makers than anybody in history. The Library of Congress is, is considered the most extensive library in the world. And can you guess who has been written about in more books than anyone else in all of human history? That too would be Jesus. He is unparalleled in his humanitarian impact. More hospitals, orphanages, rest homes, and rescue missions have been dedicated to him than to all other religious figures combined. He is unparalleled in his ability to inspire devotion. You know, other leaders throughout history have ruled with fear and intimidation. Jesus ruled with love. No other leader has prompted greater commitment among his followers. Millions and millions have gone to the ends of the earth to carry his message uh, and have done so not for money or for prestige or for other earthly rewards, but simply out of pure love and devotion to him. He is unparalleled in his impact on people's lives. When people come into contact with Jesus, they're changed. Those who choose to follow him have a unique and universal response. They want to live better lives. They want to do good. They want to help others. They want to live lives of love. Jesus is also unparalleled in his scholastic influence. His teachings and followers have contributed to more literary and educational institutions than all other human beings who have ever lived on this earth combined. In America alone, 128 college was, colleges were established in the first 100 years of our country. Do you know how many were established by churches, denominational, or religious groups? Maybe 10? Maybe half? Try all 128 institutions of higher learning were established in our country in the first 100 years by churches, denominations, and religious groups. No one has ever had this kind of impact on our, on our world. No one has affected as many human beings in a positive way as Jesus has. 100 billion people, they say, have come and gone, and yet it is Jesus Christ who stands alone as the most notable, the most unique, the most influential person in all of human history. And any thinking person has got to ask themselves, how did he do that? How did that happen? Let me ask you this. Let me ask you if you've ever won a popularity contest of any kind. Like maybe you were elected to the student council or class president or homecoming queen or maybe all state in some instrument or some sport or maybe elected team captain or camper of the week or kid most likely to do time in prison, you know, secretary of the month. At some point, you want kind of a popularity. Maybe a few of us have at different times. You know, one time in junior high school, I was named most witty in the high school yearbook. Here's an actual picture of it. Someone told me, and I said, what does witty mean? Which is why I was not named most intellectual in my school. I was named most witty. Anyway, Jesus was the most popular person in the history of the world. 
more people have heard his name and know about him than any human who has ever lived. Think about it. Here's a guy who did not come from the right background. He didn't come from privilege. He didn't have no noble or royal blood. His family was not among the cultural elite. His dad was a simple carpenter, and his mother stayed at home to raise the kids. He was a guy who had no money. Check this out. In Matthew chapter 8, he said, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I, I don't have my own home. I don't have a bed. I don't have anything. When Jesus died, the soldiers gambled for his only possession, and that was the clothes that he was wearing off his back. Here was a guy who had no formal education that we know of. It's never mentioned that in the Bible whether or not Jesus even went to school at all. Yet at age 12, he baffled the priests and others in the temple in Jerusalem with his incredible wisdom. Jesus did not travel the world. Outside of a trip to Egypt when he was just an infant, he never traveled more than 100 miles from the place he was born. Here's a guy who did not come from an influential country. Israel was just a tiny speck on the map. Uh, of its time if you wanted to be somebody if you wanted to make an impact in that day you had to go to Rome he wasn't universally loved or accepted Jesus had enemies he wasn't respected and loved by everyone the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him on the day of his death everyone except his mother abandoned him he was a guy who didn't live a long life he only lived to age 33 he didn't have the lengthy career. He only had three and a half years to make a big splash. Most of us in our first three and a half years of our careers probably didn't make a very big splash. That's all he had, three and a half. Here's a guy who wasn't particularly good looking. Now, if I were to ask you to describe Jesus, what he looked like, what would you say? Probably, you know, long hair, beard, bathrobe, Birkenstocks, you know. That guy'd be pretty safe. Well, here's what the Bible has to say. He had no beauty or a majesty, nothing in his physical appearance that would make him stand out. Now, if you went to eHarmony.com and were looking for a date and you read a guy's bio and it, it said that right there, he's like, I think I'll pass, right? So here's Jesus. He grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. He had no money, no formal education. He never traveled outside but within 100 miles of where he was born. He was not always well-liked. He only lived to age 33. Uh, 33. His career span was only three and a half years to make his mark. He would have been named to People's Magazine's list of top 100 most not beautiful people in the world. And yet he became the most popular, the most well-known, the most influential person in human history. This is the person that stands above 100 billion other people who have ever walked the planet. And again, the question is, how did he do it? What happened? Well, that brings us to the verses we're looking at today in this little book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. In this short paragraph, Paul lists seven characteristics of Jesus that help to explain how did he do it. Number one, he is the image of the invisible God. In Genesis chapter 1, 26, it says that man has been made in the image of God. Yet his image in us was marred when we chose sin over him. So we were made in his image. But Jesus, when he walked this earth, he was the completely accurate, flawless, perfect image of God. John, 8, or John 1 verse 18 says, No one has seen God, but God the Son has made him known. In other words, anyone who saw Jesus beheld the visible manifestation of the invisible God. In John 14 verse 9, Jesus put it like this, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, some people over the years have commented about how Matthew and Michael, my two sons on the front row who are sleeping, are on their phone. Uh, up here on the screen, Michael, there's actually a picture of him. Have said that these guys look like me, except I'm the normal one. Both of them, I don't know what the deal is here. Remember that old saying, he's a splitting, they're the splitting image of his father, whatever. Spitting? Did I say spitting? Splitting, yeah, well, well, split personality, I don't know. But if you've seen one of my kids, you haven't seen me. If you've seen me, you haven't seen them. It's, 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 it's not really the same thing. That analogy is incomplete and imperfect. Jesus wasn't just an awful lot like God. He wasn't pretty close to God, a perfect copy of God. He was God. He was the visible 
manifestation of the invisible God. A second factor that helps explain why Jesus was so unique, so extraordinary, is that he is the firstborn over all creation. Now, for years, the Jehovah's Witnesses have sort of misunderstood and, and misinterpreted this, this verse in trying to say that Jesus was not God, but that Jesus was a created being. They teach that he was the first among God's creation, but nevertheless, he was and is inferior to God. But the, the word firstborn used in, in verse 15 speaks of position or rank. Jesus is not the first created being. He is the highest ranking, highest, most important over all of creation. The same word is used down in verse 18. And we'll get this in a moment. On number five, Jesus is the first born among the dead. But that doesn't mean he was the first, first to be raised from the dead, because he wasn't. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Uh, the widow's son, Jairus' daughter, a few in the Old Testament. But Jesus was first in importance of those who had been raised from the dead. Verse 17 says, He is before all things, meaning that he was before the creation. Puts him on a level that is not the same as Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius. He is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. He is the firstborn or the head of over all creation. Third, he is the creator of the universe. It says in verse 13, uh, 16, for by him all things were created. Jesus was most important and reigned supreme over creation because he was equal in creating what we know of as, as the universe. So it's no wonder that the winds and waves obeyed him. He had miraculous power over all things. Why not? You know, he was part of creating them. Now, I'm no scientist, that's for sure. In our eighth grade science class, I was more into using the Bunsen burner for arson than I was for actually experimenting with things. Uh, my science teacher in the eighth grade was a former Marine lieutenant with a burr haircut. He was real good look in the 60s, you know. He was also the wrestling coach. He was, he was really mean. Well, me and a guy named Clay Walls, we used to play football. Some of you may be old enough to remember this. You'd kick the little football, and they'd do this, and they'd go through, you know, like the goalpost, right? And you'd do this to waste time in class or whatever. Well, one time, I kicked it, and it went too far. It flew over, and it landed in a fish tank that was on the desk of Coach Madden. And unfortunately, both of us got boarded really hard. So I'm not a scientist, all right? But to me, when you look at the Earth, you know, and all of the complexity and all of the intricacies of a human eye and then the, the, the massive galaxies, you know, where the nearest star, they say, to Earth is over 200 billion miles away. The North Star, that we can see with the naked eye, 400 billion miles away. One star with the unusual name of Betelgeuse, I don't know who names these, 880 quadrillion miles from Earth. We're talking about a star that's diameter is bigger than the Earth's orbit around the sun. You know, Jesus made that. People say, well, I don't believe that Jesus was able to walk on water or heal a blind man's eye his sight. It's like, well, come on, that, that was a layup compared to everything else he did. John 1 verse 3 says, through, all, through him all things were made. Without him nothing that has been made was made. The central message of these verses says that Jesus is preeminent, which means highly distinguished and exalted above all others. Jesus is preeminent over all things because he is the creator of all things. In verse 18, we see a fourth thing that points to Jesus' all-encompassing all greatness that made him the greatest person who's ever lived. He is the head of the body, the church. In other words, Jesus was the founder and the leader of the church. He is the head of all the church, that is the church universal, all churches, all Christians everywhere. And he is the head of each local church. You know, the Pope is not the head of the church. The board of deacons are not the head of the church. The pastor, the denominational leaders are not. Jesus alone is who the church serves and for whom the church exists. Fifth in the list, which we've already covered earlier, is it covered in verse 18. Jesus is the firstborn among those who have died and who were raised. Let's move on to the sixth characteristic or feature of Jesus that makes him preeminent over anyone and everyone else. 
It says in verse 19, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness, the sum total of who God is, dwell in Christ. If you look over at uh, chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. You know, through the years, uh, various philosophers and religion, uh, religious people have accused Christians of being narrow-minded because we teach that Jesus is God. But we need, everybody needs to remember, we didn't invent that claim. Jesus did. He's the one who said, I and my Father are one. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, most world religions today do not deny the importance of Jesus. Most say he's a, a, te- a great prophet, uh, a, a great teacher. They might give him prominence, but not preeminence. But is it possible for all religions in the world to be worshiping the same God when they strip the Son of God from his deity? In John 5, verse 23, it says, He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so Jesus has made Christianity narrow in that sense. So when people say, well, they're all religions are the same. We all worship the same God. It's all just different paths to the top of the same mountain. Jesus would beg to disagree with that. If they do not believe that Jesus was God, the visible manifestation of the invisible God, if they deny the deity of Christ, if they reject the Son, who the Father sent into the world, then Jesus would say, you know, their, their worship is mis- mistaken. In Colossians chapter 1 says that Jesus is unique, he's incomparable, he is supreme, he is preeminent, he is the visible manifestation of God, is first. Second, he is the firstborn, superior, exalted one over all of creation. He is the very creator of the universe. He is the head of the church. He is the firstborn or foremost one of, of, from among the dead. He is God in human form. And finally, he is, number seven, God's agent of reconciliation. Verse 20 says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now we all know the word reconcile means to reunite, to restore or to heal up a broken relationship. You know, when there's a professional football or maybe baseball strike, the owners and the players hold negotiations in order to reconcile their differences. And often they will hire someone to work between both groups, an arbitrator or a mediator, who will help pull the two sides together to come up with a mutual agreement. This person could be called an agent of reconciliation. When a marriage is falling apart and a husband and wife are separated, usually one of the two will seek to reconcile, to maybe try to heal up a broken relationship. Well, in the same way, humankind lived in a broken relationship with God. You know, the initial friendship that God shared with man in the garden was shattered when we left God behind. We separated ourselves from God to pursue sin and to just to live for self. And so God sent Jesus Christ as a mediator, an arbitrator, uh, an agent to represent God in seeking to heal up, to restore, to reconcile that broken relationship. Now, when you look at this list of seven things, this is not an exhaustive list of all the things that make Jesus preeminent, incomparable, all of his characteristics and traits, but even just these seven. I mean, who can, who can match up even one of these things? And this is just a partial list of what makes Jesus preeminent, what makes him worthy to be served, worthy to be loved, worthy to to follow. So my question for all of us today as we get ready to leave is, is he preeminent in your life? Is he important? Is he prominent? Is he preeminent? Because that's the place he really deserves in all of our lives.